We're looking at a history where people get forgotten too easily and people's contribution gets forgotten too easily. David Edge has struggled to, to, be, to, to, to leave his mark in the official records, but many people are here to attest to his contribution. Uh, and, but one of the key uh, risk factors in getting forgotten is to die too young. Uh, and Stuart Russell was somebody who did an enormous job, very much like David's, but who sadly died too young, and died at just at, at, at his peak, as it were. Uh, and he was key, in particular, in creating STIS. It was, it was the discussion between John Henry and Stuart and I that led to the merger between the Science Studies Unit and Research Centre for Social Science and established STIS. So I think we should note his crucial contribution, uh, as well as an intellectual contribution that we celebrated in a special uh, edition of a journal uh, last year. So that's, Stuart is the one on the left. <laughs> okay. So, Emma, thank you. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm Emma Crow. I'm now based at Arizona State University after about eight or eight or nine years in Edinburgh. Um, and I'm not sure. I, I'm not going to speak for the whole of the U.S. here because I think that would be a big task. I, don't, I think we have another U.S. speaker as well. Yeah. Okay. So you, we'll we'll see what we can manage. But I wasn't. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I wasn't planning to talk about all of the U.S. except to maybe start with sort of one or two quick observations about it. So so STS in the U.S. has been around um, for quite a long time. So at least 50, 60 years. We've been talking already a little bit about the sort of science and technology studies versus science, technology, and society. Um, and how that is, uh, how that's um, sort of uh, developed maybe on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and I'll say something quickly about that in a minute. Um, but I think, uh, you know, one quick observation about the U.S. and STS is that it seems to me to be a little bit less institutionalized and that perhaps, well, or there certainly seems to be less STS per capita, if you like, in the U.S. So for a country that's geographically much bigger and has a much larger population than the U.K., um, there's, it feels like there's comparatively little STS um, sort of in a formal sense. So fewer, I think there are less than 10 STS PhD programs in the U.S. Um, there, are, there is STS taught at, at undergraduate level at a lot of universities, um, often sort of smaller liberal arts colleges that teach STS programs, um, don't necessarily have graduate students and an active research department around that. Um, so that it feels, it feels like perhaps a little bit less of a, uh, a, a or a less institutionalized community. So the centers that do exist uh, do kind of stay in contact with each other fairly regularly, but it's much harder. You can't just hop on a train and be in Sheffield or in York or in, um, uh, or in Manchester in a few hours. You, you know, sort of usually requires, especially from Phoenix, um, a full day of travel to get to any other STS department. Um, so, um, so that's what it, mostly what I was going to say about the about the U.S. And I thought I'd just make a few comments about ASU. So, um, this is uh, Arizona State University, and I joined their faculty about 18 months ago. Um, and before that, I did spend uh, about nine months in uh, Sheila Jasanov's STS program at Harvard as well. So, if anyone's interested, we can talk a little bit about that. But I would say as far as ASU goes, it's definitely more of the um, science, technology, and society variety than the science and technology studies sort of orientation. And more specifically, I think after having been there for 18 months, I would characterize it probably as a science and technology policy department in terms of the core interests um, of the faculty members. So there are three units probably within ASU to mention. Um, so one. Uh, most, uh, several of you have probably heard of is the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, or CSPO. Um, there's also the Center for Nanotechnology and Society, which was a big NSF-funded program, uh, which is wrapping up as we speak. So it's 10 years of funding from the NSF. Um, and then newly, so in, in some ways parallel to STIS, uh, there's a new department that has been created as of this year. So the Center for Nanotechnology and Society is sort of rolling into this department um, called the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, or SFIS. We don't quite know how to pronounce it yet. It's still going <laughs> through that sort of phase. Um, uh, but none of these, so the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, um, the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, they're not traditional sort of STS titles, right? Um, uh, some of the key concepts and ideas that we uh, work with there, so 
Topic-wise, there's been a long-standing focus on nanotechnology, obviously. There are growing clusters of research around uh, energy in society, um, around public engagement, about risk innovation, um, and also a growing cluster around biosciences. And in terms of the kind of core concepts that motivate a lot of the work, I would say there's quite a lot of work on futures or that is oriented around futures as the title school for the future of innovation in society suggests. We've been playing with strap lines and taglines for, for the school and one is um, great minds think ahead. I think that's kind of the, what we're playing with at the moment as a, as a way of framing what the department does. Um, so within that, there's a lot of interest in, for example, scenarios and scenario planning uh, and building. Uh, the, the concept of anticipatory governance is one that has come out of the ASU um, CISPO uh, sort of center. Um, it has definite parallels, I think, with the constructive technology assessment approach, the much more European framing. Um, I'm not sure exactly of the similarities and differences, but I think there are international connections there too on how those programs are being built. Um, and ASU is also really embracing the topic of responsible innovation. So um, again, sort of something that I think has really emerged in the US, but ASU is taking this up quite strongly. It's the editorial home for the Journal of Responsible Innovation. Um, it, I think it coordinates the Virtual Institute in Responsible Innovation also, VERI. Um, I think Edinburgh might be a part of that. Um, uh, and so, so those are sort of the core concepts. Um, and then I just also wanted to pick up, oh, that's it, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, just to say one thing very quickly, again with the title Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes, is this real focus on outcomes, which is why I think, again, the science and technology policy orientation, um, this is something that is not just uh, a CSPO or the kind of STS inflection, but this runs through the entire experimental project of ASU, is to be very focused on transformative societal outcomes. Um, so that, again, is a kind of backdrop that I think is important for understanding how STS is being manifest um, in the ASU context. Um, okay. Five minutes is tough, isn't it? <laughs> Go on. Well done. Morgan, you have the, until um, Roy McLeod arrived, you were the furthest flung traveler, so uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Morgan, and I'm from Taiwan. And before I came here, I just wrote, uh, wrote a very short essay. Uh, it's called um, um, Edinburgh School in Taiwan, and how it has been understood, shaped, and criticized in Taiwan. So if you are interested in the, you know, what happened in Taiwan, please feel free uh, to drop me an email, and I will send it to you. So. In this article, basically, I interviewed um, some key figures in Taiwan, uh, in STS, and uh, I think that our understanding, uh, by our, I mean the Taiwanese understanding of Edinburgh School is in two, uh, four different lines, including the debates, Edinburgh School in debates, Edinburgh School in classrooms, in textbooks, and in translation. And today, I'm just going to talk about um, the first. I think that's the most important one. It's uh, Edinburgh School in Debate. So let me provide you with some background. So in 1987, the Taiwanese government lifted uh, the martial law and for 40 years. And as you can imagine that back in Taiwan, back in the time, a lot of controversies, including BSE, or whether or not we should go nuclear free. And back in the time, the Taiwanese government was under a lot of pressure to do something to stop these kind of controversies. And that's why from uh, 19, the 1990s, they put a lot of money you know, onto STS, try to bridge the, the gap between two cultures. And in the um, uh, 2000s, uh, the Taiwanese government decided to, they, um, they want to establish uh, an STS uh, society in Taiwan, and that's why we have got a strong society in Taiwan from 2002. And um, now, here came the Latu fever. As you can imagine, what is a Latu fever? Uh, basically, Latu visited Taiwan in 2000, and during his visit, um, uh, he delivered a series of um, uh, speeches. And these speeches uh, generated considerable interest in ANT. And uh, before long, this fever caused a sudden ANT boom 
in the Taiwanese uh, academia. So ANT approach uh, was widely used in local research and under the Latu fever, and as we can imagine, uh, the Taiwanese uh, STS scholars quickly recognized the importance of the Edinburgh School. However, uh, it was largely understood in the anti-Latu kind of debate. So that's the basic idea. Now, as you can imagine, it's very hard to promote the idea of SSK or Edinburgh School in Taiwan because we are still in the Latu fever. So let me tell you what I have done to promote. It's hard, but believe me. And um, my PhD was supervised by Stephen Yelly, and I received my uh, degree in the summer of 2010. And before my graduation, I teamed up um, uh, with some alumni and visiting scholars, and together we conducted interviews with key funding figures, including uh, David Bloor, uh, Barry Barnes, and uh, uh, Donald McKenzie, just like what Pablo is doing now. And um, these kind of interviews was published in the EASTS. Can I borrow this? Just this uh, is in English. So if you want to read it, it you can just easily find it. And in the process of um, uh, uh, publication, an STS scholars in both Taiwan and mainland China encouraged our team to translate uh, these interviews into Chinese. And translation was by no means easy, believe me, because it took us two years to finish the job. And although these interviews were certainly a good start, however, we soon noticed that um, there were no STS readers um, uh, from an Edinburgh perspective in Taiwan or in mainland China. So again, um, Edinburgh School was well known uh, in the sense that um, it is uh, something often being challenged and bitterly uh, criticized. Um, more than often, it is only discussed uh, theoretically, and, but not in a practical sense. So therefore, we, uh, we, we grouped um, our interview team and launched a book project. And in 2012, an edited collection of articles uh, about the Edinburgh approach uh, to STS was published. And Xiaobai is not here, but Xiaobai uh, contributed an article to the book. And the collection is dedicated to the memory of my second supervisor. Eh, it's not here, but here, yeah. Okay. So after this uh, project, I certainly recognized that the um, um, Edinburgh approach will not begin to take root uh, until it is applied to local, okay, local issues. Hopefully, um, we can use it to solve local problems. So having that in mind, uh, three years ago, I began researching into controversy uh, revolving around the, the importation of U.S. beef uh, through uh, a finitist land. I have to talk, tell you about a story. It's a fascinating story. So what happened? Long story short, what happened is years ago, BSE was found in the United States. And you can imagine that people in Taiwan, the Taiwanese government banned the U.S. beef from importation. However, uh, years later, we were under a lot of pressure from Ankosan to reopen our market. And you have to understand that the Taiwanese political system is just like the US system. On the one hand, we have got a president to control the, the administrative power. And on the other hand, we have got um, what we call the Congress and control the other uh, by the by the uh, opposition party back to the time. So what happened is the Congress passed a law to ban the internal organs from entering Taiwan. So back in the time, people thought it's a clear-cut ban, right? Internal organs, what not to understand. However, two years later, uh, two, not two years, two months later, the Taiwanese government gave a green light to some tricky organs, including tongues, penises, and testicles. Can you imagine it's kind of strange, like a tongue? It's kind of inside, internal, but it's outside. So I try to use that, you know, as a case study and to, you know, kind of pan out what, what, what it is. But as you can imagine, I was facing a lot of criticism from both sides. From the government side, they said, if you want to help, please do help. Give us an answer, not to mess things up. 
And from the other side, you know, let's say it's a total ban. What I did is just trying to, you know, give a loophole uh, for the for the government. So I was criticized from the both sides. So it's not, yeah. Anyway, um, I think you know, what I have learned from the beef case uh, is that the, our Edinburgh approach is quite useful, and therefore uh, it can and it should be applied to solving local problems. And it seems to me that. The best way to celebrate SSU 50th anniversary is to apply this approach to local context. And what we, uh, what we have done in Taiwan is just a start. And clearly, more are to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I oh, you have to use that. Yes, yeah. slide. So can I? Hello, this <laughs> hello. I am Bin Jong Kang, and um, <laughs> and I did my PhD here between 1903 and 98. <laughs> and many people surprised when I uh, told about that. And since I got PhD here, um, and I came back to Korea, I didn't pursue the um, um, my career in. <laughs> In academia, I work in industry, uh, telecommunication industry, which is called ISK Telecom. And recently, I got back to academia uh, with the interest of social innovation. And it's just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just very refreshing moment for me to be here. And uh, because I was asked to talk about STS landscape of STS in Korea. I was a bit worried because I didn't really pursue my career in the um, in academia. So I, after I, I will, I will shortly talk about it. And Ki Hung, <laughs> who also did his PhD here, and he's uh, he is working for academia, so he could complement uh, my uh, talk. Uh, I think. Thank you, Kim. So, it's, uh, uh, if I talk about landscape of STS, it was like um, uh, even even 90s before I uh, came to Edinburgh. Uh, people knew about Edinburgh. So, my background is sociology, and I was. It was very natural for me to be fascinated by the idea of social shaping of technologies, and my. Um, uh, so my, I uh, wrote dissertation about how uh, telecommunication industry has been uh, shaped by social context, power relations uh, within, um, the, uh, within the industry and the government, and that, that kind of perspectives. And uh, I think until 2000, there were some uh, uh, the theories and concept of science, uh, sociology of scientific knowledge and social shaping of technology and social constructivism of science and technology or actor network theory. Is, but it was very, by, uh, very small number of scholars. And uh, I think in um, by uh, mid 2000, um, there were some uh, introduction about information and communication technologies and biotechnology and nuclear power system. And those are uh, uh, the work uh, written by one of <laughs> Oscar's ki -hung and sang -hyun. And But about myself, when I wrote this, I, w I was uh, kind of emotional because I did the research about this information communication technologies, but I didn't really contribute uh, intellectually in um, in Korean academia. I didn't really publish uh, what I have done, and um, uh, and there were. There were this uh, trend, reflexivity towards science and technology. There were uh, this concept of social control, democracy, and civil participation over and towards science and technology. And that was uh, main activity throughout uh, 2010. And 
there are, I think, uh, quite prominent, prominent, um, uh, uh, it, it, it was prominent that many scholars in um, the science and technology studies participated in changing, changing uh, concept or changing uh, society uh, uh, in terms of environmental movement against nuclear power energy and health and medical movement. And there, that was, uh, I think the personal choice of the scholars, but there are this tendency that uh, uh, people, the scholars who are in this area, have that uh, have that. Uh, um, mm, I think uh, <laughs> it was it was kind of natural for them to reveal reveal the truth of uh, uh, no re reveal the um, reality. And the technology can be controlled by the people rather than uh, determined by technology itself. That that concept was uh, something um, scholars in this uh, area uh, contributed in uh, protect, protecting the society from the te uh, technological uh, determinism. Can I? <laughs> yes. And... Uh, my, okay, I think <laughs> just one, one uh, sentence I would like to contribute. The recent, uh, um, recent uh, interest, the interest I'm, um, the, uh, I'm interested in social innovation approach uh, is uh, my personal interest, but I strongly believe that I can, uh, combine or I can bring the main concept of social technical system in pursuing social innovation in Korea is my personal interest. And there are also some scholars who actually uh, look at the social technical system uh, in pursuing social innovation in uh, Korea. And that's my, <laughs> that's my talk. And uh, if ki uh, if you allow Robin, maybe one minute or two minutes, Kiyoung, you compliment my uh, yeah, um, presentation. I, I, I just want to tell you about that, uh, the current situation in Korea. We have a um, very active uh, access community in, in Korea. We have uh, four uh, university postgraduate uh, programs and uh, two research centers, which is granted by the uh, uh, Ministry of Education. And then, um, actually, uh, two, uh, over 200 uh, memberships of the Korean Society of uh, Science and Technology. So it is quite actively um, uh, moving towards that uh, we, we, ha we are quite uh, strong members. And we have a, a journal called that Journal of Science and Technology Studies, which is uh, mainly written by, the, by Koreans. But um, if you want to contribute, Always welcome because I'm the I'm the chief ed editor of that uh, journal, <laughs> and um, um, a main trend of that uh, STS is uh, yesterday I mentioned that its uh, politics are very uh, uh, closely related to science, science and technology in Korea. So um, we I, I I need to mention that one uh, uh, specific center which is called the sci uh, Citizen Science Center which is led by that, uh, some of the STS, uh, STS uh, scholars. And they have to expose that uh, Huang's stem cell fraud in 2006. Actually, that is a, a main force. And then main driving force of that uh, new bio, bioethics law in 2005 and 6. So that is the main contribution from STS community. And then, uh, so it, it is. It is very actively. Uh, in some sense, it is. Uh, it is kind of trends of uh, activist movements in science and technology. At the same time, we are doing scholarship uh, work in Korea. So uh, currently, uh, science and technology com and society communities uh, they are focusing on that uh, some kind of. Uh, uh, very politically sensitive issues like uh, probably you know that uh, it is called Sewol Ferry sinking. It is a ship all of a sudden uh, sink in, in the middle of nowhere and um, that accident kills 300 people. And uh, it, is a, it is a big uh, um, uh, big issue in Korea. So 
science and technology need to involve that uh, how why and how that the social social technological system just collapsed in 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 Korea and and this year was a, a big issue is a, a hu humidifier disinfectant uh, scandal which is uh, it's a bit ridiculous but um, uh, one chemical company which is, which is um, the main headquarters is located in London and they produce disinfectant which is pour into that uh, humidifier and spread out in the in the in the uh, small room which kills uh, basically over 200 people without knowing anything it is a uh, lung is collapsed so uh, but nobody nobody claims that the responsibility so science and technology communities now involved in uh, why and how the hell that kind of things happen and why that the regulations allow that kind of things. So that's why it is, it is a big issue in Korea now that one of the teams in STS involved it uh, and, and tried to analyze that, uh, that kind of things. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, so it is a, the, now, now the issue is how the politics and science and technology involved it. And uh, one other thing is um, uh, probably Oh, the East Asian STS community today, actually today, is uh, there. There is a, there is editorial meetings in Korea in Korea East, uh, e, uh, e, e, East Asian STS forum. Uh, the main theme is push, pushing STS beyond the national boundaries. So it is uh, is 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 going to today. This is happening that uh, uh, that forum in in Korea. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the reason I'm here is because I got my PhD here in 2000, so it's quite a long time ago, but I'm happy to be back and see how the, the place is thriving. Um, so I guess Emma was quite wise in not trying to grapple with the US SDS. Uh, so I, what I can do, I think, is picking up on something that she said about the low level of institutionalization of STS in America and, and, and mention something about Berkeley in particular, which I've been there for six years now, um, and I'm directing an, what we could call an STS center, although it's called Center for Science, uh, Technology, Medicine, and Society. So it opens to a number of other possible audiences uh, as well. Um, I guess that there is also an East Coast, West Coast difference probably. In the East Coast is probably more institution, STS is probably more institutionalized than on the West Coast. So, so I think sometimes to understand what's going on in, uh, in, 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 um, in STS in a, in a West Coast institution is quite tricky, it might be difficult to read from the outside. So considering that the audience here is mostly graduate students who might be interested in understanding patterns of, let's say, job lines, uh, I will try to say something to that extent. Um, the center was set up five years ago now, shortly after I arrived. Uh, in fact, there was a pre-existing center for the Easter science that goes back to 1972. So it was a pretty established center for Easter science and technology. What we decided to do was to turn that into a much more open and welcoming uh, institution that it typically was. Uh, and, and open up to different strains of STS that existed already on campus. So the fact was not to bring STS to Berkeley, but to make it visible and to organize a space for STS scholars to interact. Uh, often scholars who wouldn't even define themselves STS. Uh, I think about Paul Rabinov, for example, uh, um, Carly Merchant. I mean, there, there are many people who are doing work that anyway we were trying to, to bring together. Um, so the departments that contributed to that creation were history, uh, sociology, anthropology, uh, environmental policy. So a number of departments uh, across campus, some of the engineering uh, departments also contributed. Uh, the School of Information. Um, and then single individuals from, 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 from other places. Uh, I think there is an, an orthodoxy that uh, people who are uh, affiliated to the department are sharing, but it's more like, 
a toolbox, a way of looking at problems, you know, a way of handling problems in, in, in a particular way, although what we do might be very, very different. Um, roughly right now, I would say we do two main kinds of things. One is policy-oriented, uh, so science regulation, the science of science. Uh, some of my colleagues advise the OECD for technology developments in, in developing countries, uh, and this is one big part. In fact, we hired somebody from ASU be precisely because of the policy, of the policy background. Uh, the other part that I'm more directly interested in is the, stud the social study of algorithms and what started as cloud and crowd set up by some anthropologist colleagues. So information, uh, digital technologies, a critical study, if you like, of um, the design and deployment of uh, algorithmic uh, uh, procedures. Um, so roughly that's pretty much what we try to cover, although people who are affiliated to the center really do a little bit of, of everything because they, uh, in a way, they were already doing it. So our work, as I said, was really to, to, to create a synergy. Uh, another interesting thing, I guess, is that we have hardly ever hire in STS. Uh, I mean, we don't have that kind of positions. I hired one person in five years, specifically in SDS. What we hire are sociologists, anthropologists, historians that then are affiliated to the center. And maybe that's the main thing, why, the main reason why they come there, but they have to arrive through one of the established departments. Uh, so you need to be recognized as one of these fairly traditional profile with an interest in STS, and that's usually how it works, how our community is being built. Um, so I guess this connects with a few things I was hearing yesterday about, you know, what does it mean now to have a, a spate of uh, students who are actually labeled STS students. And I can see that, at least in the context where I'm working now, that could be an issue, uh, because what matters is still the the traditional, the traditional affiliation, and that's why also we try to train our graduate students with this dual uh, identity, right? So like a sociologist with an interest in STS, uh, a historian, and so on. Um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Koichi. I'm currently at STIS, and foolishly, I'm trying to capture what the, the STIS is like in Japan. And I've got a couple of colleagues from, Jap uh, from Japan here as well. But um, just to, make to, to emphasize that this is my personal view of what the Japanese uh, STIS is like. And also, you just have to tell you that uh, you are listening from the person who spent a bit less than four years working in the, the academic context in Japan and decided to come back as a research fellow here. So that's um, kind of background. <laughs> um, so I think that the distinction between the, the S and TS and the ST and S is uh, still a useful one here. And they kind of coexist in Japan. Um, but for me, it's a kind of strange and also kind of problematic way. But I think that this configuration of these two kinds of SDS is a good way of capturing the culture of local SDS. And in Japan, the S and TS, so science and technology studies, tend to be observed at individual research level. So there is scholarly work uh, paying attention to kind of specific scientific knowledge or technology and trying to unpack the nature of it, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, often done as kind of subdiscipline, just we had just had uh, this more of the kind of traditional disciplinary group, the like sociology, politics, etc. Et um, I'll mention that later as well. So we might talk about like particular scholar or particular piece of research as kind of S and TS work, but uh, the more general coordinated program level, I would say more emphasis on S, T, and S, which is science, technology, and society. The reason behind that is um, these work or these programs are initiated by the central government, um, particularly the Ministry of Education. 
the background, historical background to that is uh, Japan had economic crisis uh, since the early 1990s, and the companies downsized the uh, R&D department, and the government decided the science and technology or engineering studies at the universities will be the kind of um, seeds for the innovation. So that's where the emphasis came. And in order to make these uh, academic department in line with the economic interest of the government, there was some effort needed. And that's where the kind of STS or S and ST and S kind of work fits in. So the good example really is the Japanese Society for Science and Technology Studies, which even though it calls Science and Technology Studies, was established by, with the support from the government in 19, uh, 2001. So that exemplifies uh, the trend. Um, reflecting this local configuration, the focus tends to be more on science in society. So the relationship between science and other kind of domains. So it could be politics, economy, or the public, rather than on kind of science as culture, so actual practices of making scientific knowledge or making a technology. I just want to mention kind of big waves. So the several instances where the SDS committee could have taken advantage of the government support and won kind of scholarly independence, which I call them big waves. So the first wave came in early 2000 when the government launched three programs on science communication. Uh, University of Tokyo, University of Hokkaido, and Waseda University. The emphasis really was bridging science and society. And these three places had different emphasis. The University of Tokyo emphasized educating scientists. Uh, Hokkaido University emphasized educating citizens. And then Waseda University was focusing on journalism, so that the actual kind of individual who's trying to bridge this. So they are too busy thinking about kind of bridging, and a little effort actually was made unpacking different cultures existed in different types of knowledge production. The second wave was the government-led program again uh, called Science for Redesigning Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy, which started uh, five years ago, and it's still running. The main concerns of this program are how to improve science and technology policy and how to produce kind of relevant evidence for policy making. Um, again, I'm seeing very little work to unpack what counts as, ev count as evidence and kind of problematize the way the government frames the role of science and technology in policy making. The third and rather unexpected wave came when the real wave, so the tsunami hit the north, uh, northeastern part of the country in March 2011. There is a quite substantial amount of STS work on Fukushima nuclear plant, a power plant, which is still ongoing. And the emphasis again tends to be on science in society and there's a kind of celebratory kind of atmosphere in public participation in science, but not necessarily looking into what actually counts as participation, et cetera, et cetera. So the SDS community in Japan is, from my personal point of view, is still in the position to follow the agendas of the government, which is a bit disappointing, to be honest. Uh, just to, once, to mention the international cooperation going on, so. The, this journal, the East Asian Science Technology and Society, International Journal, uh, is a really good platform for uh, Asian STS scholars to collaborate. And also, it's a really good way of understanding what's going on in other countries, being distant from their own, well, own government. And also, that it was helped by many of the Western scholars. Uh, so, Francesc Bray is uh, on the editorial board now. So, um, yeah, I think these kind of work could uh, make a difference in changing the cultures in this uh, in Japan. So, yeah. thank you.
Um, okay, so um, I'm Eugenia Rodrigues. Uh, I'm in STIRS. I'm also Portuguese, and that's why I'm here. Um, it's to give you uh, an overview of STS in, in Portugal, um, a description um, paired with some analysis, if possible, uh, on the development of STS uh, in my country. Um, of course, I speak with the authority um, of having been trained in, uh, uh, in Portugal up to my PhD. Um, so without knowing it, I had, I had the luck to be trained by some of the best sociologists in, in, in Portugal at the University of Coimbra. Um, but uh, it was indeed a late start, uh, not just for sociology and the social sciences in general, for the country uh, overall. Um, so while the SSU uh, was thriving in Edinburgh, um, the Portuguese social scientists were trying to find ways around censorship and an authoritarian uh, political regime. And it was a sad country and a very poor country. Indeed, there's no way around it. Uh, so it was really uh, only after 1974 with democracy um, that, um, that critical thinking and sociolo sociological analysis was possible. Um, in an organized way. So I, I want to make clear that there were initiatives prior to uh, 1974, uh, but, um, and even a degree in sociology was created in 1964 in, in Evora, in the south of country. Um, but this had little critical function. Uh, and so uh, it was really with democracy that the right conditions uh, flourished in the right, uh, right conditions for social sciences and socio sociological thinking uh, appeared in an organized way. Uh, so, all the groundwork had to be done. Uh, this meant that um, there are two areas of development that ran simultaneously. So the first one was about setting up research programs on Portuguese society. They were broad in the scope, broad in the objectives, uh, asking sort of traditional questions, but trying to find specificities about the Portuguese society. And so the key themes then were really about some examples, education or social exclusion, uh, economy, class, political participation, health or democracy. Uh, a second strand was really about setting, uh, um, assuring an institutionally recognized space for sociology in the university system. Uh, so this meant creating uh, departments, creating degrees, creating research groups. So Lisbon, Porto, Braga and Coimbra followed initial, the initial example provided by uh, the University of Evra in a different sort of purpose, uh, with a different objective of providing, of uh, creating a critical analysis of the Portuguese society. Um, so once the groundwork was out of the way, uh, STS emerged. Um, so this now means that we have a landscape uh, since the mid, light, mid to late 90s, uh, that is, uh, you know, sort of nicely filled with uh, postgraduate programs, for instance, um, with research groupings on STS or closely related subject areas uh, in the major centers, the major research centers in the universities, uh, broadly speaking, concentrated in Lisbon and Coimbra. Um, the Portuguese Sociological Association has a section in uh, knowledge, science, and technology since 2010. Um, and obviously, there's an increased um, internationalization of Portuguese STSers, or Portuguese socio sociolo sociologists, essentially. Uh, sociologists are coming even, uh, they can come 
um, to other countries uh, to do their uh, to progress their postgraduate students, uh, creating research networks, and also uh, visible through research funding. Uh, it's just an example of a recently funded ERC um, project on social control, citizenship, and democracy. Uh, just to illustrate some themes, uh, key themes based on the uh, centers that I've just mentioned in Coimbra and Lisbon. Uh, so nothing terribly different from what is being done elsewhere. Uh, lab ethnographies, biomedical research, science and society with science and publics and risk, environment and health, knowledge making and so on. And this is obviously uh, a, a, um, an exhaustive list as the, the field uh, continues to grow. Uh, there are challenges, and this is my concluding um, thinkings and thoughts. <laughs> um, so what challenges uh, does the STS community in Portugal face? Well, funding, the lack of funding, obviously. Uh, this has always been an issue and it has recently been aggravated by austerity, obviously. Um, research policy has also suffered and it's, but it's been... Uh, much more tentative and sort of hesitant than um, previously. Um, the competitiveness of the international and global system of research funding. And there's also a question that some authors have raised about this, the nature uh, of Portuguese society as a semi-periphery. So uh, if this is indeed uh, the case still, it is possible to say that some traits will be reproduced in the scientific system. I would argue that this assertion uh, deserves some proper uh, examination though. Um, and just some thanks to a colleague in Lisbon who has a paper on this subject and that was great help. And if you want to find some more, uh, some websites of the key research centers that I've mentioned uh, just now. And thank you very much. Okay. Um, hi, my name is uh, Alvaro Saez. I'm a PhD student here in, in Edinburgh. Um, I think the, the one difference where, um, that we can see here in the panel is that the, I'm the only one not affiliated to, um, to a department. I'm still a, a PhD student. I was, although uh, connected to a department in, in sociology, before uh, coming uh, to, to Edinburgh. So that, that, that is my, my background. Um, I think one of the big, perhaps, differences between what you have heard so far and the Chilean experience in terms of what is happening in STS um, is that STS <coughs> um, is, very, is very, very, very new. It's not institutionalized uh, in, any, in any sense. It's been formed. It is uh, an active, uh, motivated group of uh, researchers spread um, over different universities, but not following um, the guidance of uh, one research project, one big research grant, or one uh, research center. So it works in a way in a, um, similar to what Mas Massimo, well, respecting the differences, of course, in, in scale, um, regarding uh, the connections between kind of individuals and this interest in STS. Um, so there's one big national uh, conference with, which changes from, can, from different locations. Um, the first one uh, was in Santiago, the second, the Chile's capital. The second one was in, in Temuco. Last year was in Valparaiso. Um, the next one's going to be in, in Valdivia. So that is something else that I think it's um, to be uh, mentioned. Um, which is the, that Chile is a very centralized country. So everything happens in, this, in the city center, in, the, in, the, in Santiago, which is the Chile's capital. And um, 
SDS has managed to uh, break that centralization culture by means of holding these um, conferences and um, in different in different locations, and I think that's something to be uh, to be valued. Um, in terms of the traditions of SDS in Chile at the moment, I think because I, I spoke to two or three. Uh, people are actually established in, in, in universities at the moment. Um, and I think that people normally would recognize at least three uh, branches. Uh, one SDS group led um, with interest in sociology and history mainly, so people from the social sciences. Another group with uh, coming, sorry, from the biosciences. And a third group, which is what was called previously um, uh, science, technology, and society. So it's kind of an heterogeneous but not highly connected group of people that have, int uh, that have shared interests uh, but without, the, um, without a theoretical common uh, approach or a methodological approach. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would say those are the three. In terms of research topics, most of the research at the moment uh, is kind of related with social environmental research, so research in uh, mining, pollution, environmental controversies, uh, and, edge and energy especially. That's a huge uh, area of, of research. Um, the three other areas are history of science and health, which it's, it's funny because it, it, it appears to be a, a trend in different, in different countries. Um, innovation and science policy, um, the group in Valparaiso, Jorge Gilbert, and in Temuco with Cancino, um, which work on scientometrics, um, system of innovation, and so on. And a fourth, which I wouldn't call group, is main, uh, which is uh, mainly a researcher, uh, which works uh, in, I think, in Germany at the moment, which conducts a lot of work on urban studies, which is another emerging field. So it is, um, I would say, a network more than a field uh, at the present moment. Um, and the struggles that the commu this community is facing, that our community is facing, is the one that uh, Emma previously mentioned, um, is institutionalization. So whether to go forward and make uh, a program, make an undergraduate program. Uh, at the moment, there, is no, uh, there are courses, but no undergraduate courses. At undergraduate programs. There are no um, postgraduate courses either. Um, um, and I think that is, that is um, a characteristic that differentiates between the experiences in Europe and, and Europe, uh, the US, and Latin America. So that's one, one, one major uh, challenge. The other major challenge is to set up a journal, which was uh, mentioned as well uh, yesterday by, uh, by McLeod. Um, okay. Um, and that is one, one thing that it has been trying to move forward um, with a lot of effort, but not, not very successfully. And just to finish off, perhaps in terms of opportunities um, that might be interesting to you, the Edinburgh Global Office uh, was moved f for reasons that I don't know. Um, the Latin, Latin American Global Office from Brazil to Chile, and that has led a lot of connections in terms of projects and, um, and uh, academic uh, collaboration. So recently, a group of uh, engineers, engineers in working on uh, energy uh, research visited Chile, and so that was kind of a, uh, how apparently it started. And just to finish off, um, well, you have seen outside a, uh, a very nice graph that shows the, the, the waves of people graduated from, from the Science Studies Unit. We have the, uh, Harry Collins' paper on the three waves of, of STS. And I think in Chile at the moment, we c couldn't say that we have a wave at the moment. I think it's kind of starting, um, probably, probably changing from a wave one to a wave two, um, and whether this will become uh, uh, a tsunami, as Koichi was saying, or uh, the quiet and calm waters of a lagoon is, is open and to be seen. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks very much. And I would like to start actually with thanking the PhD students for, uh, for organizing uh, this panel and also the workshop, because I think you did an excellent job. <laughs> I know we're only starting the second day, but it's wonderful to, uh, to be here, yeah, to, to see what you've made of it. And I think this panel is really, really interesting. Um, and I really enjoyed like all the contributions from my fellow panelists. And uh, when starting to prepare this, I came with quite a crucial question. What nationality do I actually represent? And talking to the other panelists, they had the same kind of problems with that. Because they were like, which country am I supposed to talk about? Now, obviously, uh, I did realize that I'm asked here to do, expect to be Dutch. And I'm still very much feeling Dutch, so that's, that's completely fine. Uh, but at the same time, I'm actually, when, when, when doing the counting, I discovered that I'm actually as, as long outside of the Dutch STS community as I was inside of it. Because I've been, I think, around seven years doing my undergraduates or my graduate studies in the Netherlands. And then afterwards, after finishing my PhD, I actually left and spent seven years uh, traveling around Europe, basically being in Vienna and Manchester and then coming to Edinburgh. So uh, the question is a bit how much of the Dutch STS community I still present. And of course, by having a bit of a distance to a country, uh, yeah, you're not as, as, as close to the developments in that country anymore. So I do sometimes re feel that, that I'm losing a little bit of touch on that. And, uh, and one of the ways in which I always try to catch up with the Dutch STS community is at conferences because they like to travel. And so I always meet Ari here and there. <laughs> so, I mean, I do see them, but I often see them outside of the Netherlands. So it gives a kind of international strange perspective on, on traveling Dutch STS and how they present themselves. Uh, so in some ways, it's actually Ari who should be talking about Dutch STS also because he completely lived through its history and also made its history to a large extent. So I'm feeling also a little bit humble from that, that part of view. Um, but anyway, I think this is basically what is, what is all representing us is that we are kind of STS travelers and we've moving through different types of communities. And uh, so next to having these issues about disciplinary identification, it's also very much what is your national identification and do you still have a national SDS identity or do you actually have some kind of yeah, international configuration or being a European SDSer, which is incredibly more difficult in these times. So maybe it's more like a cosmopolitan SDSer that, that the people are here, or at least speaking for me, I, I feel a little bit like that. Um, so what I certainly kind of like uh, learned from moving around is that there is, uh, of course, um, yeah, different types of STS, different national configurations, and also more specifically, maybe learning about different cent cities and centers. Um, but I think this moving does have implications on how I see STS and also how I see Dutch STS, because I think by moving outside of the Netherlands, I started to learn about what actually the Dutch characteristics were of STS, because if you're inside, uh, you don't really have this view. So going outside of the Netherlands, I started to realize, hey, this is maybe the Dutch approach. And this, was, uh, this started when I was going for to York for a couple of months as a Marie Curie fellow. And there I felt like, well, there is something slightly different than I'm used to in the Netherlands. And that was specifically because there, there was a lot of sociology of science. And I think it took me uh, basically more than three months to realize that this was the thing that I was struggling with, that if I was talking about philosophy or history, and I think in the Netherlands, the very characteristic is that maybe because it's a very small country, and so we're not having a lot of like SDS scholars in the community that the mix between history, sociology and philosophy is quite, and also policy and innovation, these people mingle quite a lot. So you, you encounter them during your training and so you don't really see these this clear boundaries. And um, when I was in, in, in the UK for the first time, I, dis I discovered, hey, this is a much more kind of purified sociology of science that I'm encountering. And that, of course, also uh, links back to, uh, to Edinburgh. And it was also specific so sociology because it was a sociology of the biosciences that was very prominent there. So it was very kind of topically concentrated, which was also something that in the Netherlands you kind of had more this amalgamation of different fields of attention. Um, then when I arrived in, in Manchester, I realized, which is, was the center for the history, and I also did quite a lot of history, but then I realized, oh, I'm now suddenly in a very historic community, and my own history experiences are not, um, yeah, I'm actually not a historian whatsoever. <laughs> Having a background in SDS, this is, there is a huge gap between us. So then I realized, okay, well, of course, one of the characteristics of the UK system is that history and sociology of science are quite separated, while in the Netherlands, this is very much kind of 
part of the yeah of the same tradition. So you have this kind of combinations. Um, so I think why why is this mixed in, uh, in in my experience and more in the Netherlands? It goes back particularly to my training because Maastricht is a very particular university. It's sort of the youngest university in the Netherlands, and uh, it emerged 40 years ago. And one of the it was allowed to emerge, but then the reason they they were only allowed to make programs that were not traditional that other universities weren't having. So I ended up in a very interdisciplinary program that was combining history, uh, sociology, philosophy, art history as well, literature. So it was quite a broad interdisciplinary program that I followed. And from there, Maastricht actually has a specialization in what they call technological culture, so SDS. So in my education, I never really saw these boundaries between disciplines. We learned a little bit about different approaches, but we were, as students, always kind of traversing those and having the different experiences. So these, these boundaries were not that strict. And I think this is also something that, um, if you look at the, the institutionalization of SDS in the Netherlands, we have the WTMC that you probably have heard of. It's quite a important institute in analysis, the graduate school, but it's more than a graduate school in the sense that it's also encompassing all the, the Dutch SDS scholars. And this is also a very mixed community. And again, I think this has something to do with the size of the country, also with the fact that uh, yeah, the distances aren't that far. So people can easily go for a day and meet each other, especially in Utrecht. So that's one of the favorite locations because it's central in the Netherlands. So all STSers can come there. And then these disciplinary boundaries are not as, uh, as visible as in countries that have a, a bigger um, community, I think. Um, then I think another thing that I, uh, yeah, and then obviously also from WTMC, so being this Dutch graduate school, the Netherlands has also tried to kind of institutionalize or contribute to this institutionalization of STS on a European level. So I think uh, the East community is also having some of these mixes uh, around, but that's obviously um, a more European level again. <laughs> so then another thing that I think I took from the Netherlands is the, the kind of connection between academia and society, and maybe a bit more of a practical approach uh, to STS, which very much might uh, emerge from this activistic spirit that started, that STS started off with in the Netherlands, and that might have remained a bit. Um, the Netherlands is often known for the science shops, the wetenschapswinkels, which is a very kind of practical way of bringing science to society or helping science to society. And um, also, of course, Iris constructive technology assessment and the user involvement. So there's lots of um, yeah, things that have been done there that is now kind of coming together under this responsible research innovation that has roots in, in the Netherlands. And uh, I think getting your education in the Netherlands, it means that you are always making these connections as well. So I think this is something that, uh, yeah, that I took with me, that I'm trying to always make these practical links. And it's more a kind of pragmatic making those links. So of course there's academic reflection, but there's also pragmatic side. This is more like a kind of learning and doing, which leads that I'm taking with it. So kind of try what works and, and, and then see how it goes. Um, yeah, so I think to round it up, everybody kind of makes their own personal configurations of these travels that they're taking through different communities. And I think it's very enriching to travel through these different communities because you can take from all this, well, you're meeting all interesting people, obviously, and have really valuable conversations, but you can make like your own combination out of these different traditions. And it also actually means that you have a lot of intellectual freedom because you're not have to stick with one <laughs> school or the other, but you can kind of easily combine. And I think you can also from the inside understand better uh, what, what the issues are and what the valuable things are that you can take away for your own uh, agenda. So there also gives you a, a lot of room to, to explore further uh, in your career. So yeah, that's my contribution. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Um, our last speaker is Diana Velasquez, um, who agreed to talk, and then we put the thing on at 9 o'clock in the morning, which is 3 o'clock in the morning, Colombian time, and she realised that that was possibly less uh, convenient than she'd thought. Um, however, 
uh, I was her supervisor, uh, and she taught me a lot about Columbia. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, so I hope, and she sent me last night these slides, which I read uh, this morning. Um, <laughs> Uh, having agreed with great delight. So I will now discover how much of Diana's knowledge she managed to impart to me so I can turn the tacit knowledge, the formal knowledge, into real knowledge. Okay. So she's describing uh, Colombian uh, science and technology studies, and she, she descri describes a situation where there's a lot of emphasis on in innovation studies. Um, uh, and innovation studies is also linked to an earlier tradition of Latin American scholarship. Um, uh, which is scholarship about uh, uh, the peripheral countries uh, overcoming dependency. Uh, and and, and, and for in, in that context, science and technology are seen as, 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 as roads, vehicles for, for modernization. Uh, and so there are more critical studies, but they tend to be the second row. Le less work is being done in that. Uh, less work about, uh, the, the, about governance of, 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 of technology uh, uh, and science and technology policy. Uh, but there, are some, there, are, there is some work on sociology and history of science and technology, and, and to a lesser extent on, on science, philosophy of science and technology. Now, the, the, um, she, I, I mentioned already there's, there is a distinct Latin American tradition of work, which is following on from the critique of dependency theory, I suppose is what you call it, um, uh, uh, the, the, the problems of peripheral economies in terms of dependence on, on, on knowledge and, and, uh, and equipment made in, 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 in the mainland. And, and that has um, stamped a, a key mark on how STS is emerging in the field, although she does uh, here link uh, list a number of areas uh, which, uh, where you're seeing work emerging. Um, uh, and you can read that as quickly as I can read it, so I won't read it out to you. So, so work is emerging in Colombia, uh, but, but there isn't uh, any... Colombia was not a, an, a, a flat terrain into which STS emerges. It was a terrain which already had its intellectual traditions. Uh, uh. And now, the, the, then she describes this situation that in Colombia, there's a sense that they are receivers, they're recipients of theories built elsewhere. So actor network theory, national systems of innovation theory, triple helix have been taken on board. And she feels there is less capacity to develop a critical view of those approaches uh, and their relevance to the Latin American context. So at the moment, they're theory takers. On the other hand, they're very much interested in looking at how science and technology uh, and innovation take place in particular uh, uh, lo local conditions. They're interested in, in, in the role of local knowledge, in the role of informal knowledge, tacit knowledge, uh, as well as formal scientific knowledge. So, so there is, there's an interest in, in understanding how science and technology may be domesticated. Um, uh, she talks then about some discussions about the consequences of modernization for biodiversity and, 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 uh, and, and pollution uh, uh, linked to policy and political conflicts about that. Not much about gender and science and technology. Um, uh, and uh, this, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I understand it, but it seems to me that perhaps in Colombia, uh, funding allocation decisions are strongly politicized. Uh, uh, and there is some discussion to have a level of autonomy between uh, the state and uh, the uh, and academe by creating a ministry of science and technology. Uh, uh, I, I presume that's what she's saying here. Um, she talks about how they uh, uh, coordinate their activity, and clearly we see uh, uh, links with Latin American and other uh, uh, regional uh, organisations as well as international organisations being important. Um, and then and then she says, well, what are the problems they face? Uh, and, and, and this is, uh, in a sense, a problem of local relevance. I mean, Colombia is worried about modernization. It's worried about its weaknesses in science and technology. So they don't feel much support for criticizing science and technology. They, their job is to be strengthening science and technology, uh, to, to, to be supporting strong, uh, strong science and engineering and basic science and engineering. There's, similarly, there, the artifacts are seen as desirable things. They're useful things, uh, and and the more critical accounts of of uh, of, 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 of modern technology are, are, are less of concern uh, uh, publicly. Um, then she talks here a little bit about how you situate 
social studies of science and technology inside human and social sciences. So, so uh, uh, there isn't much institutionalization of STS there, and I think people like Diana uh, are, are, are trying to do that. But here she talks about how uh, they're trying to navigate a place, and that place is already constituted by groups like anthropology, history of science, philosophy of science, uh, and STS hasn't consolidated itself. Um, uh, and again, very few postgraduate programs in the STS field in Latin America, and that forces the scholars there to go outside to, 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 to find out uh, more about what's happening. Um, so I hope, Diana, I did justice to you, but uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, But I'll just uh, stay here because I, I, I want to just make a few comments about this exceptionally rich array of contributions we've had. Uh, and we have, our, of course, we have our voices in the, in the room and we'll hope to come onto those. But it seems to me it's interesting that, that uh, the extraordinary diversity of situations we've heard described. Um, so STS is emerging. It is emerging. But it's emerging in very different ways and at very different rates and time frames. And, and what we're seeing is, is, is crystallizations of particular combinations. But these are combinations of more or less globalized disciplinary traditions. Uh, and we see very different formations depending on how, those, how, those, how, 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 how these, these, these disciplines like sociology, history, philosophy, how those are configured together. And that's an intriguing feature. Um, so we see both extraordinary difference but also some interesting homologies and homologous patterns. Uh, and I think uh, also Nikki's last uh, uh, point made me think, and also people here and people throughout the field are making their own personal career trajectories through that complex and changing landscape. And that's very interesting. So we can look at this at the institutional level of the field, or, or, uh, 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 but also at the level of individuals and their navigation through those spaces. Um, and it turns out you know, that, that history matters. Uh, uh, and, 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 and these things are being put together in relation to what the concerns of society are and what money is available and you know, how long Chile is and how short and, and slim uh, Netherlands is. Uh, so, so those things matter uh, and put a, a huge impact on it. But, um, but, but on the other hand, um, uh, we find this is a field which is uh, extraordinarily promiscuous. It's promiscuous within nations and it's promiscuous between nations and there's lots of migration and there are lots of spontaneous linkages emerging. Uh, and I think it's interesting to also see uh, intellectual convergence, sometimes planned, often accidental. Recently we had a workshop with Jan Webb and Anti here and uh, others because all across Europe STS centres had decided that there was a new research agenda around the emergence of uh, information-based uh, networks to manage uh, renewable energy consumption and use and smart meters in the home. And so there were half a dozen PhD students in STS departments across Europe doing the same bloody PhD. We get them to a room together and we have an international research program of people doing more or less comparable research. So we're finding these convergence happening all the time in our field. And that's quite useful in terms of helping strengthen the international dialogue uh, despite national differences in different uh, contexts we're in. So it's an, it's an, interesting, an interesting field, um, but there are challenges in navigating disciplinary blocks. Uh, uh, Diana is talking about this mo most recently, but all the speakers are talking about how, how do you deal with these, how do you exploit. Uh, uh, but, but, but I think what might be useful is to have some discussion about the strategies by which people manage their relationship with, dis with those disciplinary blocks. So who was talking about uh, managing multiple identities? You were a sociologist uh, and an STS person because the degree, the, the lectureship you may get may be in so, so sociology. Uh, and, and last year, Fred Stewart ran a, a grouping of national associations in STS in Europe. And the German said, you know, uh, when I speak, speak to my boss, I'm a sociologist of technology. Uh, when I speak to my colleagues, I'm an STS person. So we're, we're often having to manage those multiple identities. And we've got ways, I think, of dealing with that. And it might be useful to have some exchange about those meta-strategies by which we, 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 we deal with this. Um, so that's what I want to say about what's been ha happening so far. Maybe to, to flag some possible uh, ways forward in discussion now. I mean, 
our interest is to know how STS can grow and become stronger and richer and more diverse and better networked. Um, uh, one question is, should we be looking at how to build strong centres? Or should we be looking at how to build stronger networks between centres? And especially where STS is young and there are only few scholars, uh, uh, it may be better to see how that handful of scholars can be brought together. And we're quite excited, for example, in the discussions we've been having with our Korean colleagues uh, 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 and how, how UK scholars and Edinburgh scholars can link more effectively with Korean scholars and strengthen that exciting Korean uh, STS network. Um, uh, and uh, then the other question is, you know, Edinburgh has, has this extraordinarily diverse array of alumni and, and past colleagues. Uh, can we use that as a resource to help develop and, ex uh, uh, and export and popularise the approaches that we've been, we, we've been interested in? How can that be used to enrich scholarship Ed Edinburgh? Can that network be used to help scholars in countries where, where STS is perhaps weaker and newer to, to, to go forward? So can we use, should we, should we be setting up an alumni association? How can we use these relationships to strengthen our field and our relationship within that field? Could we be a bit more proactive in exploiting this, this, the kind of this family, the Edinburgh STS family that is present in this room? So maybe we can have some discussion of that. I'll stop now and perhaps invite discussion from the audience and then we'll come back to the panel before we close. Thank you.